algorithmic hiring create a fair and diverse workplace? Noel Anderson is Steinhardt Director of Leadership and Innovation and Clinical Professor of Educational Leadership and Policy Studies at NYU. Hello, Noel. Hello. Good to see you. Yeah, thanks very much for uh, joining me here. Could you just explain to me in as few words as possible, how does algorithmic hiring work? <laughs> so in a few words, algorithmic <laughs> hiring essentially is, is, is the use of machine learning, uh, AI, uh, quick of it, to uh, source, recruit, screen, interview, and hire uh, applicants for jobs. What kind of criteria does it consider? It considers a host of criteria. It could be anything from uh, looking at a person's experience to looking at code words that they use in their resume. It is all dependent on what the uh, organization or the company is looking for as far as candidates. And you can create the system around that. Has it been in any, uh, been in any use to great extent up to this point, or is it really a new cutting edge kind of thing? It's been, it's been actually really useful. I mean, you know, using AI to screen thousands or millions of resumes for companies, um, it really whittles it down so that you can actually target the kind of candidate you want for positions. Mm -hmm. So more companies are using it um, every day and in more advanced ways. So we can consider it to be advanced technology at this point. It's not something that's just... Oh, kind of incredibly sophisticated. I'm wondering what types of positions it's best suited for and which ones might be less applicable to the process? It ranges. Um, you, you see algorithmic hiring from everything from retail positions all the way to highly uh, specialized technical positions. Um, mm -hmm. You find that you know companies, uh, vast majority of even Fortune 500 companies have some form of algorithmic hiring for a variety of positions. You know, one of the big questions about AI and algorithms up to this point, especially as applied in cases like this, is that it tends to reflect the bias of its programmers. And so I'm wondering, how can algorithmic hiring be developed in such a way as to give everyone an equal opportunity and to create true diversity in the workplace? And that's an area that is incredibly, um, you know, important right now. And you find a number of companies as well as technologists who are working on that. So what we're doing um, in this space, uh, those on the technology side, I'm more on the policy and practice side, mm -hmm. we're trying to figure out what are we seeing in the outcomes? You know, are we seeing a distribution um, in the sense of hiring and the diversity that we want to see in our workplaces? And now we're leveraging the data to see if we are seeing bias emerge. And how do we get in front of that in the sense of the way we're screening applic you know, applications, even the questions we ask? the resumes and the kind of cold words or schools that people went to, those mm -hmm. kinds of things that can really weed out. We're trying to figure out a way to get in front of it and reorganize kind of what are the criteria for successful applicants. And that's sort of one way to really de-bias, if you want to use that term, this work in algorithmic hiring. Do you consider that to be a work in progress? You say we're doing that or we're trying to do that. It's not, a, it's not something that has been accomplished 100% at this point, I'm guessing. No, it's still it's still a work in progress. And actually, there's there's some companies that are way more advanced and aggressive with doing it. Others who are still, uh, you know, behind or trying to catch up. Mm -hmm. um, and what we're seeing, you know, on the negative side of it is that we're seeing a great deal of litigation um, emerging because folks will say that they've been discriminated against or see patterns of discrimination. So actually, uh, it's, it's the work that's happening is trying to get in front of the diversity focus, which is important, but also you know, no one wants to be sued for discrimination, hmm. especially, you know, in, in the market that is this tight when it comes to labor. Does it make situational allowances? Like, let's take, for instance, a department that has five men in it and you're hiring a sixth person. Does the algorithm take into account the idea that it might be a good idea to bring a woman in for that? Or is it just saying who is the most qualified person for this position, regardless of how many other men might already be in the department? Yeah. So, the, the, the previous challenge has been that algorithms have dependent on, depended on sort of the patterns of hiring. You know, mm -hmm. what do we see uh, as sort of the ideal candidate? Who have we hired and how have they, uh, you know, shown up in a sense of productivity um, for an organization? Uh, what we start to learn is that in some cases, these algorithms are not necessarily 100% predictive of success in a role, right? They just help you to kind of screen what could be possible in the sense of productivity. Mm -hmm. So what we're start now seeing is that perhaps the screens that we have or the criteria we have 
that are geared towards, let's say, men. We see this in technology areas, right, where we see a lot of positions have gone to men, and we need to now diversify in a sense of gender and also race and ethnicity. Mm -hmm. Now we're going back to the table and saying, okay, well, let's take a look at how are we uh, really designing these to look at qualifications, and are there some areas that we need some insight on, right, to actually increase the, the population and diversity of the population. And in some cases, the algorithms can be reorganized to look for keywords or look for experience in other ways. And that has opened up uh, more diverse pipelines. But nothing is a solution from, you know, meeting a person, you know, and yeah. having a human contact. So it only gets us to the point of creating a diverse pool. But you find that hiring managers, you know, HR organiz- you know, professionals are looking closely at the, the diversity of the folks who are coming through and figuring out how to get access to more people by going back in and doing screens that are much more expansive. And that, I think, is a great step in addition to having a human touch. Even without AI and even without algorithms, there's been a movement among companies to get away from a pure reliance on numbers. Like, what are your SAT scores? What was your GPA? What college? Did you go to Harvard? Okay, you're in. Stuff like that. Does this, do the algorithms take that in? Is there a way in which an algorithms can determine so-called softer skills or more personable things? As you say, no guarantee that the numbers are going to mean a great person, but that's always been the case. Um, yes. How can an algorithm, which is based on math, address these softer skills? Yeah, it's a great question. So as you highlighted, there have been these code words or terms that have been picked up in really the screening um, uh, software for resumes um, and mm-hmm. even online applications that have you know, looked at people's schools and looked at things about when, when they attended, what did they major in, all those things. What we're finding is that, as I mentioned, they're not necessarily predictive of success in a role. What we're now thinking about, or know more about, I should say, is that, as you mentioned, those soft skills or professional skills are largely what keep you in the roles, right? So that Harvard degree might get you seen, but it doesn't necessarily keep you in the role. Mm -hmm. And what what we're looking for, you know, terminologies like, you know, uh, uh, teamwork or engaging in agile learning or any kind of code that allows for us on the computer side to really see if there's some uh, engagement and kind of collaboration, right? Mm-hmm. Peer support, teamwork, uh, all the things that are we know are the requisite for a successful um, engagement in the workplace and ultimately, you know, uh, success in the role. So those mm-hmm. are actually a part of it. So those terms, those buzzwords that we use for professional skills are increasingly being um, screened for. So you can do that with a computer, but again, there's also ways of doing that in uh, in gamification of applications, folks who are in, engaged in gameplay or hmm. certain scenarios that are done where they're working in a team and they have to kind of figure out uh, or troubleshoot uh, working in a kind of an environment where they have to work through and with others. So those are ways in which you can also do it with a computer. But it's not a creepy sci-fi kind of thing where they're actually talking to a computer and trying to convince a computer or an algorithm that they're the right candidate, right? <laughs> I mean, they're dealing with other people. Right, they, I would think they they are they are there are some many scenarios that are done with avatars. Uh, mm-hmm. There are increasingly folks are using those for so sort of situational judgment, um, figuring out how to deal with conflict resolution. Uh, those so those do come in, and believe it or not, uh, there's some <laughs> some data coming back that uh, their uh, participants or applicants are enjoying the kind of simulated environment. Uh, really? They feel less well, stressed. And a new generation with coming up is used to that every day. So maybe that's just part of their usual experience, you know? That's exactly it. That's exactly it. So that's what's, that's what's mm. emerging. So it's interesting time we're in yeah. right now. Do you believe, I mean, at this point and going forward, should and will the final decision on hiring be left up to people, though? Definitely. I, mm-hmm. You can never get rid of the human factor. Um, the core of what algorithmic hiring does um, at, at, is to really sort through uh, the flood, right, of inquiries. Um, mm-hmm. But what we're finding is that even some companies are going back to real uh, touch points, you know, so we think about organizations like Google, you know, I talk to hiring managers at Google who are, they may use algorithmic hiring, but they are also very engaged with their recruiters to have that kind of one-to-one touch because they are, as you mentioned before, looking for a diverse pool. And so they leverage machines, but they also know that the recruiters and the hiring managers need to have that one-to-one contact. So they're putting a much more emphasis on hiring those folks, training them, developing mm-hmm. them to, to identify talent. So you're seeing some balance coming in in some spaces, uh, not in all, but 
pretty promising. And in the distant future, do you think at some point a machine might take it over or, there, or will there always be a human in the mix somewhere yeah. in your opinion? I believe there always will be a human in the mix. Um, ultimately what the future of work looks like, and I say this with all confidence, it will be the intersection between humans and machines. It will never be total replacement, mm -hmm. I believe, of, of machines in the work that we do. And that's really the, the, the work that we have to get done is figure out how do we manage the two, but ultimately humans can never be removed from this whole process. Noel Anderson, I want to thank you so much for helping me to understand the potential, the promise, and some of the concerns also about algorithmic hiring and how it can be applied now and going forward. Thanks very much for your time. My pleasure. Great talking to you.